kia ora everyone. Uh, welcome to, I'm not sure what number actually, uh, webinar we're up to now for the New Zealand uh, Telehealth Leadership Group, but it's lovely to have your company today. And we're incredibly fortunate today because Ed Brown has joined us from Canada where it's nine o'clock in the evening. Um, and that's why we're having this webinar at one. So thank you so much for, uh, for joining us uh, around New Zealand and a special thanks to Ed, who I'll introduce um, at the end of our panel introductions. Uh, now, joining us on the panel today, we've got uh, Sam Merton, who's joining us from her busy general practice. She's uh, the college president of the New Zealand uh, Royal College of General Practitioners. Um, we've got uh, Becky George, uh, who is our allied health representative and uh, chair of uh, Health Informatics New Zealand. Um, Steve Earnshaw, the CCIO of how, how many C's is it? About three C's, I think, down in, in, in Wellington. <laughs> And um, John Herries, who's um, the group manager for Emerging Health Technology in the, in the ministry. Um, and now, without any further ado, um, let me introduce you to, um, to Ed, uh, who's the Chief Executive Officer of um, the Ontario Telehealth Network at Ontario Health, um, supporting one of the largest and most active, we hear, virtual care communities in the world. Of course, one of the first questions I'm going to want to ask him is why he uses the term virtual care and not telehealth, but well, we might leave that for the, for the end and let Ted roll on with his presentation. Thank you so much, Ed. Yeah, thanks very much. It's great to be here. I'm going to see if I can figure out how to share my screen here. Thanks very much for the introduction and thanks for, uh, for having me here. Uh, I, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about it, but there's a pandemic in other parts of the world. Have you heard about that? Because uh, I've heard that you barely have anything. The whole world is kind of jealous of New Zealand right now. And uh, we're, we're kind of trying to bid your prime minister to come and run our country. Uh, so uh, we're, we're, <laughs> we're quite envious and jealous. Uh, but we have a pandemic and uh, it's had an incredible effect. And interestingly enough, uh, it's had a huge effect on our field, the field of telehealth. And uh, so what I thought I would do today just to kick off here is sort of start with kind of, uh, you know, what's been happening during the pandemic here and how that's changed telemedicine and telehealth or virtual health, whatever you want to call it, Ruth. Um, and then uh, uh, talk about what we were doing before the pandemic. Uh, so sort of, a, you, know, B, you know, BC uh, and AD version. Um, and then really talk about where we're trying to go with telehealth. So that's kind of my agenda. I think I have about 30 minutes here and then we're going to open it up to the panel. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so, uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, you know, for the pandemic, one of the big things our government did was enable fee codes for physicians that they didn't have before, uh, and particularly codes that would allow them to use any technology um, and to go direct to patients' homes, whether it was their patient or somebody else's patient, um, and also to use the telephone and to bill for that. And that was all new in Ontario uh, to open the billing so widely. Um, and people kind of really took to it very quickly because, uh, you know, it felt very dangerous to have patients in your office. People didn't want to leave their homes. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you had that experience in New Zealand, but uh, certainly here, uh, that's kind of been the, the, the name of the game every day. Um, and so people could pick any technology, but a lot of them did come to, uh, to our network. Uh, and it was shocking. Uh, over the course of about eight weeks, we had 26,000 new membership requests to be part of our network. Um, and that included a lot of physicians, something like eight or 9,000 physicians, as well as other health professionals. Uh, and eventually that uh, uh, brought our usership of our uh, hub, which is the place where people go to do video, to about 58,000 health professionals. So very, very active community. Um, and the activity was huge. So this is actually an old slide, but uh, we had about 10 times the previous volume of direct to home visits. Uh, so very, very active. And in about uh, eight or nine weeks of activity, there was over a million uh, visits just on our network. And that doesn't include people using other technologies like Zoom and what have you. Um, and in fact, I would have to say that, uh, you know, most care in the province became virtual almost overnight. Uh, they did surveys of patients and they asked them, you know, where did you get your care from? And uh, about 60% of all routine care was delivered through telehealth uh, technologies. So, you know, what that means is telehealth is not an add-on. Telehealth is healthcare right now in Ontario. Uh, and for those of you who have been, you know, trying for long and hard to do that, uh, to grow telehealth in your community, 
uh, almost overnight, the genie came out of the bottle, if you will, uh, and telehealth is now uh, really an essential and routine part of healthcare delivery. Uh, so that's exciting for us, you know, us old guys that have been trying to do that for, uh, for a couple of decades. Uh, so here's some other stuff we did. Uh, we were kind of worried that doctors would be out of commission. Uh, so we got uh, our medical association to advertise. We had about a thousand volunteers and we set up essentially a, uh, uh, a primary care clinic that anybody could come to. The primary referral source for this was our nurse call center. Uh, it's called Telehealth Ontario. People call the nurses and if they need to see a doctor, they send them to this website. It's called seethedoctor.ca um, and patients uh, uh, can visit a doctor immediately. Uh, fortunately, Primary care mostly uh, is still functional in Ontario, uh, but this service still is getting about 100, 120 patients a day. Uh, mental health is, has also been a huge challenge here with people uh, needing to stay home, not being able to go to work with everything shut down. Uh, we have a couple of tools that have been quite popular. Big White Wall, you might have heard of, is a peer supported tool for folks with anxiety and depression. Uh, we also have internet-based cognitive therapy. Um, and we just launched it, you know, to the general public in the first couple of weeks, we had over 2000 people sign up for that. That includes online courses as well as live counseling sessions. Uh, we also uh, uh, have had, had a remote monitoring program, which we've been using primarily for heart failure and COPD, uh, but a number of our regions quickly adapted that for COVID. Uh, so they're monitoring people at home usually post-discharge uh, with, uh, with an app that specifically was created to support COVID patients. Um, and of course, uh, similar to New Zealand, we have uh, a very active Indigenous community, in our case, very remote. Uh, and uh, we worked with the Chiefs of Ontario and uh, our, our uh, Indigenous partners to make sure that they knew they could get access to care uh, throughout this whole process. And there's actually about 100 uh, First Nations communities that are uh, linked up to the network. Um, and finally, we uh, reached into the, uh, the honeypot, uh, the, the funding from uh, government to support COVID. Uh, and we started a whole bunch of new services. Uh, we have assessment services, case management services that people can call into. Uh, we have a virtual critical care service that covers a vast area of Northern Ontario and Central Ontario. We amp that up in case smaller hospitals needed support. Uh, the biggest problem we had here, I don't know if you've been following this in the news, but uh, long-term care, you know, has essentially been a disaster area for, uh, for COVID. Uh, and so we've very aggressively been bringing resources to long-term care, including the ability to uh, contact general internal medicine and, and sadly uh, palliative care uh, from those facilities. Um, and we're still going. I mean, everybody here is expecting wave two. Uh, you've probably seen what's happening, you know, to our neighbor, uh, at the south, uh, we have a very porous border with that neighbor, uh, so we're pretty sure that, that uh, COVID's coming back here at some point, so we're getting ready for the next wave. Uh, we're growing remote monitoring across the province. Uh, we're setting up virtual ER, um, and that's been a really interesting challenge here because, uh, you know, emergency departments, which are usually overcrowded and people, you know, complain about waiting, it turns out that volume went down 50% across the province in terms of eMERGE visits. Uh, some people would think that was good because you know, maybe you're not getting the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the folks that don't really need to come, but in fact, there is a marked decrease in presentations with stroke and heart attacks. And that's kind of scary because that says that those people are having their stroke or their heart attack at home. Uh, so we're setting up virtual ER to help people land in the right place, whether it's avoiding the ER or, uh, or encouraging people to come in when they need to come in. Uh, and finally, elective surgery pretty much shut down. We have enormous backlogs now. Uh, hospitals have been full. Uh, initially, there wasn't enough PPE to really open things up. Uh, we've now restarted surgery, but uh, we, we want to make sure that care can, can be delivered out in the community. We want to get people out of the hospital faster. So a lot of centers are setting up uh, uh, you know, virtual care for people, both pre and post-op. Uh, so, I mean, essentially, uh, as I've said, an enormous amount of routine and urgent care is now virtual. Uh, there's a lot of challenge populations that are literally relying on it. Uh, remote monitoring has become more important. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, I think the dream has come true for those in the telehealth community, sadly. 
uh, through this pandemic, it's become you know, just part of healthcare. Okay, so that's my pandemic uh, introduction. Uh, I hope that was clear. Ruth, could you hear me okay? I can see you on my screen. Yeah, thumbs up. I got a thumbs up from Ruth, so I'm, I'm happy about that. Uh, so now I'm going to take you back in time uh, to uh, what we were trying to do uh, before COVID. Um, and uh, we actually resume most of these activities uh, as uh, the first wave has died down um, and we're uh, able to get back to regular business. Um, and what I want to do is actually just kind of walk you through uh, our strategic plan and kind of how that's connected to the actual services and the roles that OTN is playing uh, in the health community. Uh, so to start with, I guess we have to agree on what virtual care is, and uh, this, this is a definition apropos of nothing. Uh, I would say this is my definition, so it's not academic, it's not approved, it's not out of a committee, uh, but it is very simple, and it, it answers your question, Ruth, why we don't call it telehealth, um, is we just think it's anything that delivers care over a distance. Uh, that's what we think virtual care is. So any, any kind of, and, and you know, I don't even say the word technology there, there's an assumption uh, that technology is used, but it's really about care over a distance. And the reason we do it is better patient experience, better patient outcomes, and uh, more efficient and better value care. Um, and I think the important part of that is this, um, it's not really about the technology anymore. Uh, it used to be, uh, but now the technology is ubiquitous. You know, if you can dream something up that you want to do in virtual care, there's probably a really good vendor or a really good set of technologies that'll do it for you. So really what we try to do is innovate on service delivery uh, and support that with whatever is the most appropriate technology. And I think that sort of uh, realization really was fundamental to our strategy. So as part of our, whoops. As part of our new strategy, about uh, a year and a half ago, we came up with a new vision. Uh, every Ontarian has access to the best healthcare when and where they need it. Uh, again, we didn't focus on technology. We focused on making sure people get great healthcare in a timely way. Um, and when we were doing our strategy, you know, we have a lot of members and partners. We have over 1,700 uh, formal membership contracts with organizations. And as I said, we now have 58,000 people who are authenticated and using our hub. So we have a lot of relationships out there. Uh, as part of our strategy, we went out and asked people what they cared about, what their problems were. Uh, we went to people that liked us and people that hated us just to find out why and, and get a real rounded uh, opinion. Um, and after some months, we came up with uh, a new three-year business plan. Um, and we're now in year two of that plan. And fundamentally, this is it right here. So. This may look pretty simple, but it's, it's kind of a radical departure from where we've been in the past because a lot of the history that we've had is you know, providing technology, uh, building a video network, uh, building e-consult tools, uh, you know, putting in telehome care remote monitoring tools. And what we've tried to do is up the game to say, you know, we're, we're really only doing those things because we want to improve healthcare. Uh, and these are the three areas where we feel we can really make an impact. Uh, so number one, we think we can improve access to specialized care. Uh, how do we make it easier? How do we reduce wait times? How do we reduce travel? Uh, how do we provide transparency so that people can find shorter waits or find the providers they need? Um, how do we reach equity you know, and challenge populations most effectively and make sure that they get the care that they need? So that's a big piece of what we do. Uh, the second is reducing pressure on hospitals. You know, I'm not sure about New Zealand, but our hospitals... Uh, you know, have been running at 105% occupancy. Um, and we think there's lots we can do to, to help people be happy and healthy at home instead of in the hospital through secondary prevention, uh, by improving those transitions in and out of the hospital and just essentially moving more care out of the hospital and into the home. And finally, we wanna modernize consumer access to care. You know, it's amazing what you can do with your iPhone or your Android. Uh, if you wanna travel or you wanna buy something, uh, but for most people that, you know, when it comes to healthcare, that phone's a brick. <laughs> There's not a lot you can do with it. Um, and uh, it turns out that, you know, it's an awesome device for healthcare. Um, and uh, I think there are just enormous opportunities to, to bring services to patients in a very convenient way, in a way they understand, in a way that, uh, uh, you know, really delivers services uh, in a timely way. So we're working hard on that. 
So in order to do that, uh, these are really, this is really the set of rules that we've adopted. Uh, uh, really fairly simple. One is we offer some programs and solutions. So although I talk the talk about impact, we still offer programs, we still offer technology solutions. Uh, we also uh, work hard on innovation. Uh, we drive adoption across the province quite aggressively by you know, working directly with providers and really creating knowledge tools and activation resources for them. Um, and we really support our government in testing new policy, coming up with policy ideas, um, and helping them to advance uh, the art and science of telemedicine uh, uh, business models. So what I'm going to do is just kind of drill down on each of these just to give you kind of a flavor uh, for what we're doing in each of those areas. Um, so uh, this slide really covers uh, most of the programs and solutions that we offer. Uh, you've probably heard of video, so we provide an awful lot of video visits out there. Uh, last year, we actually, uh, which is 2019 uh, year, we actually provided about 1.4 million video visits across the province. Uh, so very active. Uh, that number is being, you know, crushed by this year's number. We've already got, you know, over a million in the first sort of nine weeks of the fiscal year. Uh, so I'm sure it's going to be a lot harder. And last year, about 482,000 unique patients benefited from uh, a telemedicine service, a telehealth service of some type. So to give you an idea, our population is about 14 million people in Ontario. Uh, so I don't know what percentage that is, but about 480,000 out of the, out of the uh, 14 million. So um, eConsult e is another service we offer. That's where primary care providers can uh, asynchronously ask uh, a question of a specialist and they get an answer back in a couple of days. And there's about 65,000 of those questions were asked last year. Um, uh, I mentioned we offer critical care. We also have a provincial telestroke network that has about uh, 28 hospitals in it. Uh, there are uh, virtual emergency services, particularly we've been offering that to our remote First Nations nursing stations. Uh, our air ambulance system is a participant in that as well. And that's been uh, growing uh, quite nicely as well. Um, and uh, central to all this is really our hub, which is a place where you can sign in and do these sort of things. And uh, there's a health services directory in there that has about 25,000 health professionals and telemedicine sites listed out there. Uh, so you can find somebody, you can tell people what service you offer, if you offer a service, uh, and you can do stuff. So you can launch an e-consult or launch a video event or schedule uh, through that uh, hub. Uh, digital self-care, uh, I mentioned remote monitoring earlier. There's about 3,600 graduates a year that go through a six-month intensive program. Uh, and the outcomes are remarkable. For uh, congestive heart failure, we've been able to reduce uh, hospital admissions by about 32 percent, uh, according to a most, the most recent study, uh, which is quite amazing because, uh, as you probably know, heart failure is one of the major reasons for hospitalization, so uh, that makes a big impact. Uh, we also have a number of vendor of record, but I'll come back and talk about that. Uh, E-Visit Primary Care is a very exciting project for me because this is really on the modernized consumer care side. We uh, started this about a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, uh, it's been quite successful. We, uh, our pilot had about 275 physicians and about 30,000 patients. And basically patients could text their primary care doctor and ask a question. Uh, patients loved it. Their satisfaction rate was about 99%, which I've never seen before. Um, and uh, oddly enough, our uh, cranky colleagues, our physician friends actually you know, kind of liked it too. They were worried that you know, patients would overwhelm them with emails every hour of the day or messages every hour of the day. Uh, and it turned out that patients are pretty respectful of their provider's time. Um, and of course, I mentioned uh, the mental health issue. Oops. Uh, mental health. Um, and last year, about 17,000 uh, Ontarians signed up for Big White Wall uh, as well. So that's been busy. So that gives you an idea of some of the programs that we are managing right now. Um, a really important part of what we do is the patient access network. So as you know, there's different ways to deliver telehealth services. There's a, you know, direct to home where a provider can see you on your own device, your iPhone or your, uh, your uh, PC or Mac. Um, but uh, the other type of, of video is really in a studio where you have, you know, a, a, usually a hardware telemedicine device. There's often a nurse, there could be a digital stethoscope. 
Um, and we have a lot of those sites around the province. There's 500 sites that do that full time, another 500 or so that do it uh, at least part time. Um, and that's very important. That's needed for clinical purposes, if you need the technology or the nurse, uh, but also for equity purposes, for people who don't have a phone, who don't have a connection, or uh, who need a private place to be able to have their consultation. So to us, uh, that's really a critical thing that we must maintain. We're actually very actively trying to enable providers to use their own technology for direct to home visits because we don't think we have to provide that for everybody. We'd like people to use things that are easy for them to use that are secure and safe. Uh, but we certainly want to maintain the interoperability and the access to this uh, patient uh, access network. Uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, uh, about 118 Indigenous communities that are online. Uh, we're a bilingual uh, country, and so uh, we're, we're actively promoting French language services, and we've been able to do that effectively. Uh, and we have every prison in the province uh, hooked up as well, uh, and that's really saved them quite a lot of money. That was the annual savings last year, uh, just because they don't have to transport the bad people back and forth uh, out of the prison with, you know, police officers and guards doing overtime to sit with them. Uh, in order to enable people to use the technology of their choice, we've launched this partner video program. So we've created provincial standards for both video and secure messaging. Um, and uh, we're just launching this, but the goal here is to, uh, is to actually uh, certify uh, technologies so that providers will be able to use them and eventually bill through those particular technologies. Um, and finally, the hub. I mentioned the hub. Uh, this is the place you go to search for things, to organize things, to, oops, to do things, um, and that's where the directory is and it's a source of uh, interoperability. So this is uh, rule number two, which is adoption. Um, I don't think I have to tell you this. I'm pretty sure there are similar issues uh, where you are, but uh, there are a lot of challenges to uh, making virtual care really effective. Uh, there's uh, organizational challenges. Uh, in our case, uh, there's really a misalignment between uh, the funding model and the solutions. So what that means is uh, people don't really uh, get paid for their innovation, which makes it challenging to, uh, to keep adding new innovations. Uh, individual providers they have issues they need to get paid. They often don't have uh, the management capacity to introduce new things, uh, to really, really build this into their workflow. Um, and, you know, change. Every change is fantastic as long as it's not you that has to change. Uh, so that's always been a challenge is to get people to try something new and do something different. Um, and our government still has policy elements that aren't quite there. As I mentioned, we're, you know, we've been... Uh, it's been a work of art to uh, kind of advance uh, physician payment. We've, we've come a long way, but we didn't quite get to the end zone uh, when this pandemic uh, broke out somewhere in the middle. Um, and uh, there's still uh, a lack of uh, coherent design that uh, folks are working on. We also have a lot of outdated legislation, things like our Public Hospitals Act uh, you know, haven't been changed since 1970 something. Uh, so they never anticipated technology and the type of innovation that uh, has occurred since then. So there's still lots of work to do on that front. Uh, really what we do to support adoption is two things. We have a bunch of resources and I've listed some of what that looks like there. You can find stuff on our website if you're interested. There's an awful lot there. Uh, and we also have an advisory service that really is hands-on uh, working with organizations. And the goal there is to help organizations, you know, with, with their business problems. Uh, we, we don't really go in there, you know, saying we need technology. We go in there saying, like, what are you trying to do? What are your goals? Um, and then we see if there are technologies that can support them or new processes that support them. Um, the first thing people always ask us for is data. So we spend a lot of time uh, farming our data and telling them how much they're doing. Uh, and this is a sort of a typical dashboard that a hospital or a health team may, uh, may ask for. Um, and I thought I'd just give you an example. You know, I don't know what it's like to drive adoption in New Zealand. Uh, maybe you're small enough that you can just tell somebody to do it. I don't know. Uh, but no, okay. Uh, but uh, it, it's a big effort for us. So uh, we tried a new program about a year and a half ago. Uh, these are some of our biggest hospitals. And we, uh, we asked them if they wanted to uh, join us in a partnership to really 
launch integrated ambulatory care across their facility, ambulatory virtual care. Um, and uh, we learned a lot of lessons and we kind of came up with a bit of a formula. Uh, so we, we required the CEO to sign on uh, in order to engage with them. Otherwise, we would just walk away because uh, if, if the CEO is not committed, we're not interested in spending our time there. Um, and then we had two planning workshops, which is kind of fun because the first one was asking them, you know, what are your business problems? What are you trying to do? Um, and then having them brainstorm around how virtual care might uh, support them in their goals. Um, and then we went away and we tested their ideas with the front lines who said, yeah, that's crazy. You know, that's madness. Or they said, that's a good idea. Um, and then we came back for a second workshop just to confirm the actual projects that we were going to do. Uh, and then we really formalized this with them. We built a plan. We built a governance structure. They had to meet every month or two. Uh, they had to identify champions. They had to turn it into a project. They had to identify the toolkits and resources. We helped them provision everybody. And then we had our staff stand around in these ambulatory departments and just see how they worked and what their workflow was uh, so that we could give them advice on how to redesign the workflow. Um, and we, of course, created an evaluation plan so we could see if this whole thing was successful based on the targets that they uh, had set. So this didn't work with all the hospitals, but it actually had really good results with a lot of them. Um, and this is just an example of what one hospital did in a year. Uh, you know, why they did it, what they were trying to do. Uh, the reasons for doing these things are different. I think this hospital wanted to reduce no-shows. Uh, they wanted to, they had a, they have a very full parking lot, so they would prefer not to have patients complain that they couldn't find parking around the hospital. Uh, you know, there's always different issues in different facilities. Um, and so this is how they did it. And, you know, within a year, they had five brand new programs. They had uh, 70 health, new healthcare providers delivering care, uh, five times the level of direct-to-patient visits. So uh, this is the kind of work you have to do. Uh, in a large organization just to get people started, just to start to shift care uh, to what you need to do. Uh, so this is the third role, which is innovation. And uh, this is the one I like the most because it's fun. Uh, and what we've done over the years is really try to identify you know, models of care, clinical models of care that we think can really make a difference. Uh, we find partners, uh, we set up evaluation type pilots where required. Uh, we have set up vendors of record uh, with vendors that can provide the service. So the idea being if the pilots are successful, that other organizations around the province will be able to purchase the technology uh, without having to go through a whole new procurement process. Um, and uh, this has been great. I mean, these things, uh, interestingly enough, you know, a lot of them started out really slow. Uh, with the pandemic, boy, were we ever lucky that we had these things in place because uh, they're, you know, I think they're very, very useful. Uh, and a lot of them have uh, have grown. Uh, this is, uh, I mentioned uh, this project earlier, but the reason I, I bring this slide up here again is really for my last point, the last rule. Uh, this this project, uh, you know, went really well. We we had actually two vendors of record for this. Uh, I think one of them is probably in the audience out there, Navari. Uh, and this went really well. We had great, great uh, uh, participation and uh, good technology. Uh, but the really interesting thing about this was that we invented a physician fee schedule. Uh, we invented fees for secure messaging because we didn't have them, um, fees for telephone calls, uh, and we already had fees for, uh, for video visits. Uh, but we did that with our government, with our physicians, and we piloted that. And we've learned a lot, and uh, we're going into negotiations, uh, government and physician uh, groups in October, and I think that this pilot will be a great source of information and will become part of that negotiation. Okay, so that's kind of what we do, uh, what we're trying to do and what we're actually doing. Uh, I think I just have three slides left here before I get to the panel. I think I'm still okay with time for another couple of minutes, Ruth. Yeah, I got a thumbs up. Getting a lot of thumbs up today. Uh, so uh, really, you know, if you come back to our three goals, uh, Really what we're trying to do, you know, here's the statement, timely access to specialized healthcare depends on where you live, and in many cases, who your doctor knows, and it shouldn't. So we're really trying to address that. Um, and uh, you can see at the bottom, um, really what the targets are, build those programs, target at low access patients, leverage our assets to really improve referral patterns and make it easy for uh, both health professionals and patients to participate.
Uh, this one is about the hospital and basically too many people who don't need to be in hospital are. So how do we support them and keep them happy and healthy at home? Nobody wants to be there. Uh, so really it's about secondary prevention. It's about remote monitoring, uh, empowerment and behavior management. Uh, it's about uh, uh, really supporting providers in those new models of care, those innovations that, uh, oops, that I showed you earlier. I gotta stop the screen from jumping. Um, and uh, really about designing innovative uh, models that uh, can keep people at home. So there's lots to do there. And then finally, modernizing access to care. Uh, Primary care delivery in particular is provider centric and we think it should be patient centered. Uh, so how do we do that? We're very actively expanding virtual primary care. Uh, we've got innovative mental health solutions um, and our province is really building a new support for healthcare navigation for patients uh, that uh, will be what we call a single digital front door for patients. That'll make it much easier for them to find what they need, to connect with their own primary care providers, other providers, um, and uh, stop kind of the confusion that most people feel when they're trying to figure out how to take care of themselves or their family. Uh, that particular item is very exciting for me. Whoops. Um, this is kind of a mock-up of, you know, just an idea of what that could look like. Uh, that is not a real nurse. That's a nurse bot. Uh, so you can imagine going online, you know, asking some questions, getting some advice, getting some information. Um, and then if that's not enough, uh, you know, drill down to get uh, to get services, whether they're urgent, whether they're from your own primary care provider, uh, being able to uh, find programs to get preventative care, lifestyle management, disease management, um, and of course, care at home. So thinking about holistically, what is that journey that patients need to take uh, through the healthcare system and how can we help them get there leveraging this digital front door? Um, I think that's it. Okay, that's the end. So I'm going to pass it back to uh, to you, Ruth, and to the panel, and I look forward to any, any questions that anybody may have. Excellent. Thanks very much, Ed. And you might just want to stop sharing for a, a moment. Um, and, and look, a special thanks, um, as you mentioned, to Navari and Mark Cox for putting us in touch with you. Um, we're very grateful. I'm not sure how, how, how grateful you are, seeing as you're at nine o'clock at night uh, talking with us, but uh, we do appreciate it. Um, there's a number of questions out there in our Q&A. What I'd like everybody to do, you, there's 108 of you out there, is to vote on some of those questions. And the ones that we don't get to answer, which are still really popular, we'll go back and we'll harass Ed until he gives us an answer to them. Um, <laughs> what I'd like to do just briefly, though, before I go to the panels, is Ed, um, we've obviously got very similar problems here in, in New Zealand in terms of our health system, per se, but I wonder whether you could just comment briefly on on your health funding, particularly as it result, relates to maybe primary care, just to give us a little bit of an insight and perspective. Uh, so how primary care physicians are paid? Mm, just the funded, yeah. yeah, so it's interesting. It's kind of a mixed model. Uh, there are uh, fee-for-service physicians who simply bill our health insurance uh, system for whatever they do. Uh, that's kind of part A. But there's also things called family health teams and other uh, patient enrollment models where patients actually enroll with a provider or a set of providers. And those folks are usually capitated. Uh, they also shadow bill. So uh, they actually earn 15% of the fee for service on top of their capitated rate for the patients that they see. Uh, I, I don't know the exact split, but I think there's probably roughly, I don't know, maybe uh, 50 or 60% are actually in those capitated practices last I've checked. Uh, and the others are fee for service. Right, okay, now that's really helpful, gives us a bit of context in there as well. Um, now I'm just going to go to the panel um, briefly before we get to the main bulk of questions. So I'm just going to ask them to make any comments or questions as we go along. I'm going to start with Steve. Thanks Ruth, and uh, thanks Ed for a really interesting um, presentation and it's very, very impressive what you've achieved. And one of the things that comes across to me is that you've got this sort of wide range of different tools and programs and things that you've developed and which creates a parallel problem to ours in that we've got a plethora of different apps and, and tools, none of which talk to each other and you end up with this sort of difficult mess to try and integrate. So to what extent have you managed to integrate these tools into a platform or are they all sort of standalone applications each in their own sort of separate piece? 
Yeah, that's a huge, you know, source of thought and conversation. So uh, historically, we've been very lucky because we have a, we've had a single hand provincial network that connected everybody, right? We have 58,000 health providers who are using that single network. Uh, but we actually want them to start to use other tools now. Uh, and we're aggressively going that way. Uh, we don't think that uh, if you're direct to home with your patients, you really have to use a provincial network that's interoperable like ours. Uh, so we want them to use stuff that's easier to use, that's integrated into their electronic medical record or their hospital information system. Uh, the challenge is, you know, there's about 14 different physician electronic medical records. There's uh, uh, at least four or five different hospital information systems I'm familiar with. So uh, we're not going to be able to integrate our solution with all of that. Uh, so we want them to go ahead and use what's, what's useful. At the same time, um, we're, we've built our hub and we're now actually aggressively working on it so that it's standards-based. If you have standards-based video, for example, you'll be able to link to any site in the province through that hub, right? So we are building that facility. Um, and if I kind of step back a little, there's a much larger project that uh, we're just getting off the ground now. The legislation has just been passed that will require all healthcare providers to provide uh, fire-based APIs, if you know what that is, uh, which would, and standardized data uh, that can be accessible in real time in standard form by a patient or a proxy for that patient. Right, so that's a very aggressive program that will liberate all the data and create a requirement in law for people to share that data in real time. So that will solve a lot of these problems in the areas where we wanna have standards-based tools. But I don't, you, know, you don't have to get stuck on that. There's lots of things that just don't need to be standardized or that can be, that can be integrated locally uh, based on the local needs of that hospital. And there's so much innovation in virtual care. There's so many different apps and, uh, and solutions that you know, if we force people to use one thing, it's going to be obsolete in you know, six months, and it's just the wrong thing to do right now, where the where the field is changing so quickly. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much uh, for that, Stephen. Ed, um, Becky, I'm sure you're burning with a question or a comment there. Oh, my head is buzzing with ideas and all sorts. So there's lots to process from this. Thank you, Ed. Um, really, I think with um, my allied hat on as well as um, Hen's hat on, but from an allied health perspective, I believe that telehealth has got a massive impact to play in preventative um, space, in preventative health and well-being. I love seeing that cognitive therapy uptake and the evaluation that you're doing around that. What I'm interested in is understanding, I suppose, just operationally, um, our healthcare services are very connected. They rely a lot on the collegiate networks um, around. And at the moment, my, my interpretation of the platform and network that you're talking through and describing um, describes a very single point of access and then sort of just that, that sort of very uh, slim channel. How do you, how does it enable uh, one professional to link or, you know, pass forward on referrals or make multiple referrals out so that one patient can access more than one professional for uh, themselves? Yeah, well, when it comes to the video service, uh, people use it any which way they want. Uh, so they can, I mean, they can hunt for uh, you know, providers in that directory of 25,000 people and pick the people they want to pick. Uh, they can kind of do anything they want. Uh, we don't actually, though, manage the actual referral side of it in terms of transmitting a piece of paper uh, or a virtual piece of paper from somebody to somebody else. Uh, that's something that's a separate project in our ministry that will eventually converge with what we're doing right now. So we don't actually manage that particular process, but we offer that information so that people can find each other if they don't know each other, uh, or they can connect to the people that they already know. Right, so the directory really provides, obviously, a wealth of information about who's out there. Does it allow yeah. them to connect with the most relevant and geographically based, or are we looking at literally just remote and, and, and sort of the telehealth perspective of, hey, I, I know so-and-so and, -so and I'll, you know, let you know about them. Yeah, but that's a work in progress. But, uh, you know, those 25 people actually create their own profile in there. Uh, so they'll say, you know, they may be listed, the tombstone data may say, 
uh, psychiatrist, but then when they enter, you know, their data, they'll say, I only take patients with eating disorders or whatever. Uh, so people will say what they actually do, and we're really trying to encourage that. Uh, we've had some big pushes to really make that data as useful as possible. Uh, for example, in the city of Toronto, uh, we had a push to get every single specialist in there. So we have 4,700 specialists who have profiles. And we also added every single health program in the city. So another 4,000 programs can be found in our directory on top of the health professionals. Uh, so if you need to get your toenails clipped or you know, whatever it is, you can find a service in there as well. So we're trying to make that as, as useful as possible. Now, one of the issues for us, of course, is we, our province is still kind of aggregated. Uh, and so we're all looking at how we can create a single source of truth that can be used for multiple different applications. Because uh, right now ours is uh, just kind of one area. Yeah, so this comes back to balancing that tension between informing um, our seekers for service and the providers who um, provide. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Excellent, thank you. John, I'm sure you've got some comments and uh, questions as well. Yeah, um, I suppose the interesting question I've got is obviously they say, um, you know, an overnight success takes a long time. Uh, if you were, you know, if you were giving advice to people that, that do innovation, um, and I would say the people on this call um, are people that are, are innovating in healthcare, what, what sort of advice do you give to people in that kind of general sense of innovation in healthcare? So it might be virtual care, it might be telehealth, it might, might be something else, but um, I suppose I'm kind of interested in, uh, in your opinion about, you know, what makes good innovation in healthcare and kind of what makes it sustainable? Well, I, I hate uh, technology plans. So I learned, I learned early in my career, if you went to a hospital and they decided to give the telemedicine solution to the AV guy or the technology guy, it was just going to fail. Uh, so I run away from those now because really it's got, it's, it's about value, right? It's about what is the clinical value? Uh, what problem are we trying to solve? What's our strategy? Whatever that question is, it's got to be something somebody cares about. Uh, best case scenario, there's a business model too. Uh, so if you do something, there's a way to pay for it uh, or a way to recycle, you know, the, the, the savings into something else. Uh, so it's really about, you know, value, find value and, and go for it. Uh, and then champions, right? You have to have somebody who wants to do it. You have to have leadership to be able to do it. It's, it's really hard to change. And if there's nobody cheering and pulling that flag, it's just not going to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, check the policy pieces as well. Uh, physicians and uh, other health professionals love to get paid. Uh, they'll, they'll do something voluntarily for a while because they're incredibly altruistic people. But uh, after a while, that burns people out. So you really have to think about uh, all those pieces. And then finally, I think I, I tend to think of it as a value chain, right? Whenever you introduce something new in healthcare, there's always a whole bunch of uh, pieces to the puzzle. There could be organizations, there's providers, there's patients, there's technology, uh, there's policy. And actually every one of those little links has to be linked together or it just doesn't work. A single link failing and your whole project will go down the hill. So really, you know, taking a step back and making sure that all the pieces of the puzzle are there before you launch. Um, innovation sounds sexy, but it's really hard work. Um, and uh, I guess the other issue is really knowing what innovation is, right? Innovation is not a new toy with flashy lights, right? Innovation in the business sense means a better business process, right? It means doing things better, uh, faster, cheaper, better patient experience, better outcomes. It's, it's about a process, it's not about invention. That's really good, thanks. That was a great, uh, a, a great question and a very wise answer. Thank you very much, Ed. Sam, do, before we go on to these other great questions that people are asking here, do you want to make a comment or have a question for Ed? So, um, yeah, my comment for Ed is, um, you mentioned that there's 118 Indigenous um, people's groups that are involved in this and we're, did they, there's a couple of questions I have. One of them was, had they taken this up before um, COVID hit and were they early adopters? Um, and then the second question is, um, is there a um, change to the patient outcome that they are seeing that means that they want to engage in it more? Because it's an issue that we have here. Yeah, so uh, 
I have partnered with an indigenous organization since 2001. Uh, I know I don't look that old, but uh, uh, we've been working together for a very long time. It's a group called Kiwetnik Okimakonik in Northern Ontario. Um, and they have been providing services to about 30 fly-in communities, so communities that don't even have a road. Uh, and uh, so you know, we've been doing it for an awful long time, and they, they've supported us to expand that. We've also brought in our Métis Nation and uh, other Indigenous groups as well. Uh, so that has been steady and has been growing. Uh, every community that we went into in the early days, we actually uh, met with the elders or they met with the elders. They got band council resolutions to support it. So it was very well supported in each community. Um, and I think uh, it's very positively received. I think people rely on it now for a lot of services. Uh, our, you know, we've got a unique uh, environment, particularly in Northern Ontario. Uh, there's, a very, there's a small town um, called Sioux Lookout, and uh, there's only 5,000 people that live there. But if you sat around at the airport there, it probably looks like Sydney Airport because there's a, not a big plane, but a little plane landing every minute, just coming and going from all those communities. And those planes are taking food and supplies to the communities and they're flying sick people out a lot of the time. Uh, so it's really been a lifeblood and a, and a real support to those, uh, to those communities. Yeah, I have friends who um, live in Thunder Bay, so I know where Sue Lookout is. Okay, there you go. So you know the story. Did I answer your question, I hope? I don't know. Yeah, you did. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Okay. Yeah, I'm guessing that none of us are going to be coming to visit you anytime soon, Ed, but uh, it's great that we've got this technology to be able to uh, uh, get in contact and learn. Now, there's a question here from um, David Grayson. Thank you, David. Are you seeing drop-off back to pre-COVID levels engagement for virtual care? Or are there now higher levels of engagement? So I'm not sure actually where you are in your in your COVID. We we, we of course talk about pre-COVID because we're kind of you know you know through not yeah good for you yeah situation obviously. Well, Toronto's not fully opened up yet, so mm -hmm. uh, we haven't got to. We have uh, three stages, so we're still in stage two. Uh, Ontario's got about 160 to 200 cases a day right now, so it's been kind of wobbly. Uh, hospitals have started to empty out a little bit, which is great. So they've started surgery. Uh, so I think virtual care is still pretty active. Um, it, it has opened up. I actually am going to my dentist tomorrow, believe it or not. Uh, something I wouldn't have dared to do or, uh, well, I couldn't have done a month ago, but now they've, they've reopened. Uh, so it's starting to happen. I don't know exactly how virtual care is tracking at this moment because it's so fresh. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll get those numbers in about a month. Yeah, I love that idea of the dashboards that you had there. I think that's a really great way of sort of displaying where things are, are at. I guess uh, eventually having something live would be even better, wouldn't it? We'd follow them like the COVID worm. Right. Yeah. Um, now, did you have a challenge in having a video platform that supported integrated use across private, public, primary and tertiary? So that's a video platform specific question then. Yeah, well, in the old days, no, it was easy. We just provided it. Um, and people could use it through our membership model. Uh, and the way we did it was um, if you were funded by our government, it was free because the government was funding us. If you were doing it uh, as a private group, then we charged you uh, to be part of the network. Uh, so it was pretty straightforward and anybody could actually use it. They just had to follow the rules of the road. They had to sign a contract um, and uh, you know, obviously respect privacy and other elements. Mm. And just in terms of, of challenges for first time users now, so I think we're talking about clinical, clinical users, um, but I'd also be interested from pa a patient user perspective actually. Um, so maybe three specific challenges or more for, for clinical users and the challenges for um, uh, patient users. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, it depends which technology we're talking about, because uh, obviously there's lots of different technologies there, but if you're, if you're referring to video, uh, there's two flavors, right? So if a patient goes to a studio, they don't have to do anything because uh, there's a, a nurse or an administrator who's doing everything for them. Uh, so that's great for those who are good with technology. Um, if it's a home type visit, then you have to have, you know, a phone or a, or a computer. Um, and our service, we've, we've spent a lot of time trying to make it as dead simple as possible. Uh, the way our service works is they, uh, they get basically an email 
um, and it has a, a link in it, and they click the link, and the thing starts on the on the on the moment. You know, it, it kind of works. Biggest problem they have is you know maybe their internet's lousy, uh, or sometimes they can't remember why they have the appointment. That's another problem. Uh, but essentially, we think it's pretty easy for patients. Other solutions, uh, like our Navari friend, uh, provide an app for patients, and again, they find it very easy to use. So uh, that that's critical. It's got to be simple for for people. Uh, providers have a different problem. Uh, you know, uh, every minute is valuable for providers in their offices. Uh, a lot of our colleagues are very harried. Uh, they're seeing an awful lot of patients, um, and they don't want to spend time. So things that cause uh, that, that make them lose time are annoying and irritating. They don't want to do that. So trying to make it as simple for them as possible is also essential. Uh, the number one complaint we get from you know pilot projects in particular uh, from uh, physicians and other health professionals is it's not integrated with their EMR. So they want everything to be integrated in their EMR. They want to sign on once and be able to do you know, everything in their life uh, through that one EMR, which is totally understandable. Uh, but a lot of these things, you know, especially in pilot mode, uh, simply are not integrated and that's a challenge for them. Yeah, and one of the challenges that I can tell you that we have in New Zealand is as well as the, the uh, uh, broadband um, issues and coverage um, is certainly that we have a lot of uh, groups perhaps with a with a shared email address so we'll have family members with shared email addresses and um, uh, there's actually a question in here also about privacy and I'm wondering how you deal with those sort of aspects of you know when perhaps a family member has you know multiple people sitting with the same email address and and apart from that also the privacy issues within protecting um, patients. Yeah, we're, we're kind of crazy about that. Uh, we, we couldn't do anything without a real attention to privacy. And we have, I think we have a team of four people that does nothing but that all day. Uh, when it comes to the emails, uh, that's actually the challenge I mentioned a minute ago. We send people an email, but it doesn't say anything about who the doctor is or the other health professional they're seeing because we can't add patient uh, uh, private information in, in an insecure email, right? So that's a challenge for us. We're hoping to address that uh, once Ontario uh, comes up with consumer digital ID, that will change everything. Uh, or if you sign them up for an app, obviously you can make that into a secure app, but that's not how our particular system works at the moment. So that's so we get a few calls like that. I got this appointment from you. I don't know who the doctor is. I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Uh, and that's a bit of a challenge. Uh, the actual technologies themselves are obviously, you know, secure and uh, we do things called privacy impact assessments and threat risk analyses on pretty much everything we do. Uh, all the vendor partners that we work with uh, generally have to go through that process as well. So uh, they, they usually hate it, but then once, once they've done it, they get to brag to other people that they've been, you know, they've gone through the mill and they're safe and secure. Uh, so at the end of the day, it's probably good for their sales. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, that's a, a, a it's, it's a non-starter. You can't do anything unless you guarantee to people that there is privacy and security. Can I just flip that on its head, Ed, um, and think about it from a consumer perspective? So something that um, has come up in a conversation um, with a health professional recently with me is um, patients recording uh, the session with the clinician. Do, are you seeing that happening more? Do you offer that as a thing? Do you save the video to the health record? Uh, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, we don't. Uh, we used to do that in the olden days. Remember, remember those uh, VCR machines? Uh, we used to have those underneath the video conferencing platforms and uh, we offered to do that. And uh, interestingly enough, the doctors made us stop. Uh, they didn't want to do that. Uh, so uh, right now we don't do that at all. Now you can never stop a patient from doing that. And uh, I think a doctor's worst nightmare is when they're in court and the patient pulls out their iPhone and says, yes, you did say that, you know, they, <laughs> they click on the, on the recording. So that is a problem. And I, I spoke to one of our uh, malpractice lawyers who told me that that's an increasing problem now for physicians. Do you have any integrated experience measures or outcome measures built into your platform? Uh, some of them. Uh, so we do surveys. We do. We, we have a, a partner that does a lot of research and evaluation on many of our projects. So that happens in different ways. Uh, often surveys, counting. Uh, I, uh, some of our platforms, uh, like the primary care e-visit platform, you can ask a patient a question at the end. Uh, also, uh, with our e-consult platform, we always ask providers 
you know, if you didn't have this service, uh, would you have had to send the patient for a face-to-face -face referral? Uh, and we could actually switch up those questions depending on the uh, uh, particular interests we have at that time. Uh, so there are, there are opportunities. I wouldn't say it's kind of totally built in. It's just, uh, you know, grabbing opportunities around the edges. If we really want to study something, we have to launch more of a formal evaluation. Okay, so, so the, the aspect of I've completed my consult with my physician and they asked me three questions of how did I find that, what was the experience, yeah. you know, those kind of things need to, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, with your hubs that you've had, there's a question on the chat about where you've actually put the gear into a remote place. Is that usually um, the home or a hospital or a clinic? Uh, when there's actually hardware type devices, yeah. So that's... Uh, kind of all of them. So uh, every hospital in the province is a member and they all have technology. Uh, there's about 400 mental health agencies. A lot of family health teams host hardware technology. Uh, there's a number of uh, uh, opioid uh, counseling centers that have technology. Uh, as I mentioned, there's prisons, uh, child and youth centers, uh, speech pathology center, uh, long-term care facilities. So it's pretty much ubiquitous. Uh, across a lot of the spectrum of healthcare. And when you were talking earlier about the nurses who have the gear so that, you know, patients who don't have the technology themselves, where yeah. are those nurses situated? Yeah, that's, uh, that's any of those places. Uh, okay. So our province actually funds, I think it's about 180 telemedicine coordinators that are scattered around the province in key places. Okay. Uh, and so they're, they're nurses. Uh, who are there to uh, assist in the physical examination and to help uh, the patient with follow-up and other activities. Uh, you have to understand a lot of those patients are, are ill. You know, for example, patients may go for their cancer surgery at a cancer center, but then they get followed up remotely um, and they need that kind of clinical support. Uh, people do a lot of stuff remotely, particularly in the north. So, you know, you'll do all your cancer follow-ups that way. There's chemotherapy delivered in remote communities. Uh, there's even a remote uh, a radiation center that people uh, can get care at. So it's very active. Well, sadly, we are pretty much out of time. I, I don't think we're out of questions, but we are, we are out of time. Um, just before we do, do wrap up, I, I would just do a little plug for um, NZHIT, who are running a digital identity um, uh, webinar and in-person gathering as well um, in Auckland, I think at the end of the month, so you can, you can find them at the NZHIT uh, website, so yeah, do go and have a look at that. And of course, I'm sure that uh, uh, Andrew from Mobile Health has got more webinars planned for us um, as well. Um, look, I think, Ed, you've got a whole bunch of inspired people out there. I think just showing what you, you know, you've been able to do is really impressive. Um, both, both pre and through COVID. Um, you're obviously working really hard. And uh, we can only thank you for sharing your experience with us because I think that's been absolutely fantastic. And we've really, really enjoyed it. So Ed, thank you again. Um, do enjoy your, uh, your evening off now that we've deprived you of an, of an hour of it. Um, and we'll all go back to our post-lunch post activities. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's been great to meet you all and thanks for the great questions. Cheers.